Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. We are short of some people because apparently there's a manifestation as a result of which quite a lot of the roads around here have been blocked off uh, and the heat, etc., etc. So we are missing some people here, they are arriving, but we're going to get started anyway. The very first thing which I'd like to do is to thank enormously Christie's for partnering us on this and for providing this wonderful room. Very kind indeed. Part of the purpose of the two lecture series which the Cambridge Society of Paris has devised is to link up with other organisations in Paris, to extend our network, to enlarge the, the range of the Cambridge Society, and hence this evening is a wonderful example of that actually happening with Christie's. Thank you. Just as a reminder, this is of course a standalone lecture, but it's also part of our Glory Days of Paris series. It's lecture number two. And the Glory Days of Paris series had the introduction about a month ago. We started in Montmartre. We now have four lectures to do with the 1920s and 1930s. And then we move out of that era into the 1950s at the end of the series. So today's lecture is, as I said, a standalone lecture, but it forms part of that theme. Uh, the 1920s and 1930s were sort of fascinating in that it was a very interlinked world. And tonight's theme is the philosophy of the 1920s and 30s, which binds together the artists, the writers, the designers, and everything else that goes with it. We happen to have one of the world's leading experts in this particular topic, Dr. Alice Mand, who took her degree at Trinity College Dublin, uh, studying fine art and modern English. She's there at TCD, she got a double first, and even better, she got a gold medal for exceptional academic performance. So we're already in very good hands. She then did her PhD at the Courtauld Institute, before then moving on to Cambridge, where she's a reader and a fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge. She works in the uh, fine art department at, at Cambridge, and her specialization is contemporary and modern art, and in particular, her uh, particular field is the dynamic between the body and body politic of art, photography, uh, film, and performance. Exactly what is the <laughs> dynamic between body and body politic, I'm not absolutely sure, but we may discover <laughs> later on. The only thing which I do know is that evidently her research goes wide and deep because she seems to have stumbled across my Instagram account, which forms an important part of her current research. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, Alice has inevitably written numerous essays, articles, catalogues. She's written two books fairly recently, uh, Surrealism and the Politics of Eros, and Eroticism and Art. And she has just cur curated a, an important retrospective exhibition that was, took place in Madrid and at the Tate Modern on Dorothea Tanning, Surrealist, and indeed the final wife of Max Ernst. She is now working on another book, which is uh, The Marquis de Sade and the Avant-Garde. And she tells me she has a particular affinity, a particular liking for, for Paris, because as a child, when her father was studying existentialism, apparently he used to come over to Paris, and Alice said to me this morning, we were sort of brought along in his wake, I can blame it on him for my taste of in Paris and the left bank. Another thing which I discovered this morning, she has a particular leaning towards the concept of writing and art being things which ought to work together. Uh, one of her courses for, for Cambridge is Livre d'art, d'artiste, and because of that she knows Paul Destrebatz well. And although it has been a very secret pri private collection, she has seen the Destrebatz collection on quite a number of occasions in the past. And that is, of course, going to be a joy for us when we are allowed to see it here at Christie's in a few days' time as the sort of ancillary event to the talk this evening. But I think uh, before I start launching into all sorts of other things, let's welcome Alice Mann, Dr. Alice Mann, and we very much indeed look forward to this wonderful talk. And I know that you happen to be one of the world leading experts on Dadaism and Surrealism. 
And as Andrew says, um, the, I have to admit, when he asked me to speak about the philosophy of data and surrealism, I sort of presumed it was a 12 lecture series he wanted. To try and fit it in to 45 minutes is impossible. So if we begin on that premise, hopefully um, you won't be disappointed. Um, but what I am going to do is talk about data and surrealism um, from around 1915 through actually to the 50s and 60s, a kind of longer frame of data and surrealism, because uh, as he says, I'm very immersed in the idea of the international avant-garde, and specifically how often their subject matter and uh, works and texts, which seem to be almost obscene for their own sake, scandalous for their own sake, very sexually explicit, um, actually need to be uh, deeply contextualized in terms of society, in terms of history, and in terms of how the body was being manipulated often by the powers that be, or by political regimes. Um, so, one of the other things to say about Dada and Surrealism is that um, they attacked all institutions. And again, that's the kind of spirit we have to enter into this evening's talk with. They attacked the institutions of the church, they were against God, they were attacked the institution of the nation, the nation state. So while they uh, very much gravitated towards Paris, um, the idea of national boundaries was something that they really protested against. Uh, and they also protested against the concept and the institution of the family, um, in the sense of a traditional domestic makeup. Um, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of women of the avant-garde were drawn towards data and surrealism because it challenged um, the expectations that people had for them as women, um, which would have denied their creative talents uh, as artists. So we find also that they attacked notions of civilization. So because they argue that Western society's obsession with a civilizing mission had only dehumanized society, an obsession with advanced technology, empire, war, uh, territory, these things that actually dehumanized man in the 20th century. Uh, and so we tend to think of Dada and Surrealism as this critical voice. In terms of their philosophy, in terms of their profile, uh, I need you to think of them as barbarians, because that's the word they used. They were barbarians storming the gates of civilization, the gates of the city, the gates of the art market, the gates of exhibition spaces. Uh, I don't know if they would turn in their graves for me to be here talking um, about Dada and Surrealism and Christie's, but I do know, having enjoyed the collection of Paul Dersiva uh, and his generosity when I was doing my PhD in, in the Courtauld, but living in Paris in the late 1990s, his um, encyclopedic collection and the fact that he was willing to share it with a, a young student who was, what, could actually work with these things closely um, was very much in the spirit of the avant-garde. And that idea that an artwork, a livre d'artiste, could actually change your life and make you think differently, um, as I say, is, was very avant-garde. And I'm delighted to be speaking at the time of this uh, event, this um, sale of Desribe as a part, a very small part of his magnificent collection. And I'm dying to see it upstairs, having enjoyed it in his uh, apartment. Um, so as I say, if you, the first image I've put up there is to get you into this idea of the barbarians. This is a painting of Max Ernst, who Andrew mentioned, who is the last husband of Dorothea Tanning. That's how I like to put it, rather than her being the last wife of him. Um, but Max Ernst is painting the barbarians of 1937, gets you into this idea of uh, art as activism. Art is something that actually was about storming the, the gates, starting afresh. There was a kind of tabula rasa mentality about it. Uh, and at the same time, you have a man and a woman, these bird-like creatures in a frottage technique, actually seeming to, as I say, brave new territories. And it was done in 1937. It was done when he was having a relationship with Lenora Carrington. Um, it was done when he had moved to France from Cologne, uh, where he's part of the Dada movement. Um, and it was done in a spirit of how art needed to wake up the public. At, in 1937, at a time when over in Germany, in Munich, Hitler was staging avant-garde art as degenerate, including the art of Max Ernst, who was singled out as a threat, as degenerate, as work that needed to be burnt. Um, in retort, in response to this, the Surrealists in Paris were showing works and saying, this was, as I say, a, a call to arms, 
uh, a need for people to wake up and realize that worse was to come, that the sort of the clouds of war were hanging over all of Europe. Um, and what's interesting, and I like to tell this to my students, is that most of the surrealists that we deal with were dropout students. <coughs> so they abandoned courses in medicine, in psychology, in art and fine art. Or in the case of Max Ernst, he dropped out of a degree in philosophy at the University of Bonn. And why? Well, because he said that any studies which might degenerate into breadwinning uh, were not for him. This was taboo. And also he was only interested in what he described as seditious philosophers. So he wanted philosophers who were not going to talk about ethics and humanity and the moral good. His leaning was more towards people like the Marquis de Sade. Um, and his leaning was more towards the licentious, the subversive, the transgressive. And again, a kind of philosophy that demanded a response rather than told you universal truths. He said, painting is not for me either decorative amusement or the plastic invention of felt reality, which is how we'd normally think of it. It must be every time invention, discovery, revelation. So there was something quite utopian, ironically, in their vision for art in a very dystopian moment in the interwar period. This was a traumatic time. This was artists who had experienced World War I, uh, by and large, the first group. Uh, as Dadis and Surrealists, and who were adamant that we needed to think twice or there would be World War II very quickly upon everybody. So this is the idea that the barbarous cry was not for its own scandalous sake. Um, they weren't just searching for new means of expression, new techniques, like the rubbing of oil paint, which you get in frottage. Um, the idea that it was as simple as a child doing a leaf painting or a leaf drawing, where you just take a rubbing and do something that was automatic, lack skill. This was the type of thing that the Surrealists uh, pursued. And as I say, Max Ernst is someone who served on both the Eastern and Western fronts in the World War I. And one of his first works as a dadus in Cologne was a sculpture to which he attached on, on a rope an axe. And the invitation was for the spectator to come along and hack the art world work to bits. So that element of anarchy or nihilism, that idea of you needing to be involved, to be enraged, to actually act every time you saw a work of art, and demanding almost that you complete the work of art as a result, again, is the core of the philosophy of this group of Dada and Surrealists. Dada fed into Surrealism as a movement, but very much out of this destructive anger at the fact that people needed to think twice and art had to alert us to, to change and to the possibility of change. So Max Ernst is someone who, as I say, bridges Dada and Surrealism as, as movements. In 1922, he moved to Paris and was very instrumental in bringing a lot of Dada uh, European ideas to Paris, to André Breton, alongside Tristan Zara, who'd also moved over to Paris in 1921. And he was based in Paris in France until 1941, when he finally fled France, unsurprisingly, because it was occupied. And thanks to the intervention of the American Rescue Committee and Peggy Guggenheim, who had become his lover and his third wife, uh, and who managed to uh, bring him from the south of France, from Marseille, over to New York, sponsoring his travel and saving him because he was on the, the auto list, as it was known, the list of so-called degenerate artists who the Nazis were determined to seek out and remove. So we have also an idea that this is where poetry, where art is emphatically political. And it's not just because someone like Max Ernst was a member of the Communist Party. It was because his art was seen as a weapon, as something that was obscene, that was a threat to the political status quo. And this idea, again, of the Surrealists, whereby philosophy was about action, responded to this moment in that sense. So the Dadas and Surrealists saw art as what we call praxis. That's the idea of it being philosophy, not just as an abstract, but as something which was embodied and if anyone here has studied philosophy or studied Aristotle, you'll know that praxis translates as doing. So it's not just seeing art, it's the idea that you're doing art. It's a process, it's something that demands a response. And humans do three basic activities. They do theoria, thinking, they do poesis, making, and they do praxis, doing, according to Aristotle. And compounded with these are three types of knowledge, if you didn't know this. Theoretical knowledge, the end being truth, often what we think of classical philosophy. Uh, poetical, the end being production, again, where the artwork might be seen as a product. 
and the third practical praxis approach, which as I say, was about doing and the goal was action. So the art was a mode of action and it was to uh, allow the spectator to enact, to respond, to, to, as I say, complete the work of art and hopefully to look at a work of art and then begin to think and act differently. So that's the essence of a philosophy of surrealism, as I say, is this praxis mentality. And André Breton, who I'm sure you all know, who uh, is the, one of the founding figures of surrealism when it was launched in Paris with a manifesto in 1924. He would say quite famously in the 1920s, that's him speaking down, isn't it? <laughs> it's interruption. I mean, this is very, improvisation and interruption is crucial. But uh, he would say that in 1929, he said, the simplest surrealist act consists of dashing down the street, pistol in hand, and firing blindly as fast as you can pull the trigger into the crowd. So again, you have an idea, as I say, not just of the storming of the gates, but the crowd, the city, and the streets of Paris. He was a pacifist. He was someone who was a medic, a medical student in World War I. The last thing he ever had or wanted was violence. But his point was this was, it was more paintbrush in hand storming the crowd, but this was, as I say, the spirit, the philosophical spirit of the Dadas and the Surrealists. And Dada was born out of World War I. I always say out of the ashes, I mean, out of the live experience of World War I. It was born in 1915, 1960, um, and was born in, in Zurich, Cologne, Berlin. It moved to Paris, it moved to New York. So another key characteristics we have about the Dadas and Surrealists was this idea of a network, a kind of countercultural network, where people came together in different cities, they collectively exhibited, they did collective works, Again, because this broke down national boundaries at a time when um, they were leading to so much blood loss. Um, and it's a spirit in terms of a network which continued right through to the 1940s, 50s, 60s, when we have neo-dadism. But the dadists were adamant, as I say, that their art was to be an alarm bell, which is why you have... Uh, does this work? Oh, no. It doesn't work as a pointer. But it's where you have a little clock ticking in the bottom right-hand corner of the Picabia collage here, which is on the screen. And this work is called, by Francis Picabia, the Dada Movement. And this is, again, the idea that it's not a movement as a school, as a style, out of the Impressionists, for example. It's literally a ticking movement, and it's agitating. And it is the idea of it being in movement that lies at the heart of the Dada spirit. And it was a spirit which was going to take the academic tradition, or in particular, it was mapped out here, his name is there, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, who the Surrealists and the Dadists loved to mock in their paintings. And they would take that great father figure of the academic art, Ingres, and his nudes, and they would replace it with provocative collages that sort of might strike people as being childlike, naive, confusing, lacking technique. They would replace it with journals, which is why 391 is written there in a little bomb-like box, because this is a journal that Picabia launched again in Barcelona and moved it to Zurich and then moved it to New York between 1917 and 24. Uh, and because this was part of the agenda about spreading corruption within the art world so that, as I say, things might change in terms of society and politics. So as a collage, also as a, as a sort of metaphor for Dad and Surrealism, this is also important too, because the collage idea is putting several different things together. It's not creating a perfect, idealistic, illusionistic image. It's not a pretty picture. It's a work of art that you're puzzled by, that you have to read, that you wonder whether language has any meaning. And he said of this journal 391, every page must explode. So you're getting a sense of this language again. Whether through seriousness, profundity, turbulence, nausea, the new, the eternal, annihilating nonsense, enthusiasm for principles, or the way it is printed. Art must be unesthetic in the extreme, useless and impossible to justify. So again, this is a call to arms through art by a young generation of artists who were very much traumatized by war, lost a lot of friends through war, and recalling on art as a vehicle for change. For, as one dad has worded it, for us, art is not an end in itself. It is not a product, but an opportunity. Art is an opportunity for the true perception and criticism of the times we live in. Uh, and ironically, that actually is resurfaced more in contemporary 
art at the moment. We're enjoying quite a renaissance in terms of surrealism in particular, and amongst a lot of younger artists and women artists, um, where they see it as actually a vehicle, again, for criticizing the political times we're living in. It sort of resonates, again, with younger generations in that sense. But as I say, we have the idea of art as an alarm, a cry, a howl. And that brings us to the name Dada. Because as you can imagine, the name Dada is in itself a manifesto. It is a political statement if you were to wear it on your t-shirt because Dada, in theory, is a word that they found by chance by putting a finger or pen into the dictionary. So chance, the dictionary normally is what defines things. If you're stuck, you can't understand a word, you can find the definition in your dictionary. They were against dictionaries, the idea of one fixed meaning. They put a finger in a dictionary and you come out with the word in theory Dada, which of course just sounds like an utterance. Perhaps the first word a child might say, usually teething, da, 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 da. They might say da there. They might say da, da for a father. Um, so it is something that goes back to something very primitive, very universal. It doesn't matter what country or what language you speak. Um, it is something that speaks to us all in its simplicity. So it's a word which, as I say, is in a manifesto in itself. Um, and they like the fact that actually, if you looked up dad in many different languages, it meant different things. For the crew Indians, it meant the tail of a holy cow. In Italian, apparently, it can refer to dice, or a mother, or a wet nurse. Certainly in German, it's there. And for most people, they also think of it as perhaps uh, a recognition of a, a figure in the family like the dada, because dada is often a word children say before mama, which is a harder word. 